Welcome to Define, the podcast making the most important projects in crypto easy to understand and accessible to all. This week, we speak about insurance in DeFi and why it's so relevant for helping us to scale this industry to the broader world. So this week, we invited Nikita from Solus, a novel new insurance protocol that enables people to underwrite their risk in DeFi. So Nikita, welcome to the show. Could you please start by just introducing yourself and tell us a bit about how you got into crypto? Yeah, so um, my whole background is in engineering. Um, I started in crypto about five years ago in like early 17. And back in that day, I was um, in, just in college, like studying mechanical engineering, was doing research in uh, microelectric mechanical systems and like machine learning processors. So a lot of focus was on like computer architecture, fabrication yeah. and like electronics. Yeah. Um, so I had kind of enough technical depth um, to start mining crypto. And literally the, the whole story started from me coming across like a random article. I think I like saw an ad or something that you could like make money on your computer by like not doing anything. You know, I got excited about <laughs> it and I read the yeah. article and it was like, yeah, you can just run your laptop and mine crypto. So I tried it, ran it overnight, uh, then did the math, like how much energy I consumed and all that stuff. And it was profitable. So, I mean, obviously like overnight it was just a few cents. And I was like, if I scale it to something, then I could uh, make some like meaningful money by like not really doing anything, but like setting up computers. And so that spun out and I did that for a year. I started like building mining operations for myself, like mostly focusing on GPUs because getting ASICs was a little harder at the time. Yeah. But then I finally got a hold of like a few manufacturers in China and like we shipped like uh, bigger uh, piles of that. And I was like selling um, some hardware in like buildings, setting up farms. So one of the bigger Bitcoin farms I set up was like in Estonia, but then also like in the US since I was like living there. I actually yeah. completely maxed out all of my apartment electricity and like <laughs> so, like circuit breakers went off like a few times. because wow. um, And I had to like route the wires around different outlets because I was like right. checking which outlets go to which circuit breakers. Yeah. So I was pulling all the energy that my apartment could like provide. <laughs> yeah, and I was mining. Efficiency. Yeah, and luckily, like I had a um, balcony, so I created like a cardboard like box, kind of like the the the, the farm, and then put it like all my like computers. There were like ASICs there. Um, I had like the time I think like eighteen GPUs on the balcony. Oh wow! Uh, mining, so it, it was pretty profitable. You know, like running the two thousand seventeen boom was a lot of fun. Yeah, um, but then eventually. You know, it's a lot of system administration work, just yes. like upkeeping the hardware. So I was like, that's kind of tiring and I don't want to do it anymore. Mm. Uh, so I started like more like coding on the side. And also like after uh, the bust happened in 2018, there wasn't like as much excitement. And I didn't really have at the time a community around me. Yeah. So like none of my friends like, you know, engaged really. So um, I just continued kind of like lurking around, like coding a little bit by myself. Uh, and obviously like managing the tokens actually like never like sold and I, I still like haven't like sold those tokens really oh, that nice. I mind. So, uh, yeah, I mean, probably like not the best financial decision, but like <laughs> it's nice to cash out sometimes, yeah, um, course. especially with the, all these like crashes and stuff. But, um, but yeah, so that was like my intro in crypto and how I like stick with it. And so in 2019, just got excited about like ETH. 2.0 and got into Prism. So I was running like validators and mm. um, doing all that work on the test net um, back then. And um, so, yeah, like to me already then it was pretty exciting uh, to do crypto. And I could seriously consider to like pursue a career in there. Uh, but then, you know, as an engineer, I was a graduate in college, still doing like research. And I was, I wanted to learn more about computer art engineering, computer architecture. Yeah. So I applied to grad school, you know, I, I got um, basically like paid to do masters and then like was on a PhD. So I was uh, at the time focusing more on like machine learning processors. And to me, it, it was um, just something like exciting and like interesting. And <clears throat> like I was intellectually like challenged. Yeah. Uh, even though I honestly never like really saw myself pursue a career in that. I never wanted to be like a researcher in like a big corporation or, um, you know, like design uh, microprocessors. Yeah. Um, so I finished all the classes the school had. Um, and then basically the only thing, like I passed the exam and the only thing left was a dissertation. And um, COVID kind of like 
allowed me to have like some space because the lab was closed. Yeah. So I couldn't work in the lab. And I was like thinking like, okay, like what do I do with my life now? Like, do I actually pull full throttle behind, you know, getting a dissertation, get my PhD or should I pivot? Because like, I don't want to like half send it, you know, you, you yeah, send it. Absolutely. Absolutely, <laughs> um, yeah. And, um, and then, yeah, I made a decision to just uh, pursue like crypto full time. And, um, that was like right around DeFi summer. Mm -hmm. Um, so obviously like a lot of projects were like doing the farming and the insurance need kind of became apparent because like all the hacks like started happening yeah. and I was deploying like my own coins. Like I was helping like a bunch of other people like in deploying like their coins and um you know deploying their coins you, you get worried um that oh like what if there's a hack like how am i going to explain that to other people yeah, not true. So, like what like can i get insurance for it or like how do i hedge that type of risk yeah and everything that was on the market at that time and like all those ideas um so they're kind of suboptimal uh if, if yeah. i put it lightly <laughs> um and, and so yeah i kind of took a month to come up with like my own architecture like how would i want to do it yeah uh, and then i kind of like took a leap of faith dropped out started developing and for the first three months i was like writing code by myself yeah um, before like starting like on board like more people and yeah, um, yeah. kind of like openly communicating because obviously like you also can feel sometimes like you were worried about like putting out your like idea out there Absolutely. And, like until it's know, fully mature and you've done it yeah, yeah. I, I just like want to make sure updates. that like i fully understand and like i know my thesis behind it yes um before i like start introducing more people to it yeah that's, no, that's a that's background. a really methodical approach it's great to learn about how you how you really started at the crux or the base layer you know proof of stake mining understanding how the chains work and then you saw this crazy DeFi summer event happen and to hedge the risk of all of these protocols and code mistakes, some of which you, I guess, live through yourself and seeing these suboptimal insurance protocols. If, if we can just dive a little bit deeper into that, what were you seeing that wasn't quite right with those insurance protocols in, in terms of their architecture? Yeah, so generally I think, um there were two major approaches how people like envisioned this insurance working back then. Uh, one is obviously like mutual and, you know, Nexus Mutual came out of that idea. And then there were also a couple others. Um, so so the, the mutual one, could you just describe what that is? Yeah. So basically a mutual is a bunch of people, you know, putting their money in the pod in case one of the participants is like something happened and they're at a mm -hmm. loss, then we all collectively can like, help like rescue that guy so you see a lot of that type of activity let's say among the agricultural like farmers yeah right like some farmer like nobody can predict the weather there might be a drought and so the farmers they try to like share that risk they yeah. basically like pull uh, the money all together so if one is in distress uh, we all can like help him out um, so that's basically like how mutual work and that's what Nexus did um, you know like their token um it's basically like you join the mutual uh you put in some money in return you get like a token representation of like that share uh and then everyone can buy like policies on their like individual like exposures in DeFi. Uh, yes. um and so that's basically how it works and if one of the participants um lost the money they can open up a claim and basically ask that mutual uh and all the to, members to vote. the claim yeah all the members like vote on it so yeah that's kind of like one way to approach the problem and obviously you see a lot of them like appearing early because generally the mutual model is pretty straightforward and not very like complex um to to execute and um with insurance like for example there are a lot of like oh how do you like manage like underwriting capital how do you assess the risk like there, there are a lot of these like moving parts and components that um you know in traditional world allow for like much greater efficiency but then from the standpoint of um just you know getting a product out there and uh trying to like cover uh, a wider population like mutual has been like utilized throughout history yeah um, yeah you see you see many examples um, yeah like there's cooperatives um in the uk as they're known and I'm, I'm sure they're called similar things in in other countries and and that's one way of doing it and you, and you also mentioned there might be another way of doing it. Yeah, so 
back in late 2020, one like a very big idea, I think a lot of people are pretty bullish on it, was prediction markets. So what if you just uh, bet on two different outcomes, right? Like people who are betting that the protocol will get hacked are virtually like hedging that risk because if the protocol gets hacked, they can get the payout, right? Because they won the bet. Uh, yeah. And then on the other side, you have people betting that the protocol will not get hacked and they're underwriting that kind that of, like, you know, insurance like that yeah. risk, right? And so Augur was uh, one of like the early uh, protocols that facilitated that uh, cover protocol um, we did that and, you know, they had a few iterations, um, but then obviously like that model, even though it's fairly like easy and like straightforward and to conceptualize and like understand it, um, just doesn't really, like didn't really work well at scale. So that's why you don't see any prediction markets right now trying to like yeah. hedge, to quick like, hedge the risk. Absolutely. Um, so they're not as like well suited, but that was like very interesting mechanic. And I mean, I definitely like very hardly like thought like whether it could work and like maybe how to like make it more efficient because like people at that time like already you know wanted to see it, and so it, maybe I could have like iterated on on that idea to like reach like a better solution. But then at the time I was uh, yeah like I decided not to go with it. I, I think yeah. I, Basically, like the major issue I saw with that is like the, the capital efficiency and also like just lack of um, kind of like risk assessment and underwriting. The thing is like with these very deep technical risks, uh, it's it, it's hard to just utilize like wisdom of a crowd. Uh, like, yeah. you, you know, when people bet, they usually don't really um, like have a good way of like analyzing like the risk. It's, it's, it's like one thing you're doing it for fun, but like if you think like underwriting risk and mass, um, it, it doesn't work so well. And generally people are like intuitively good at it. Yeah. Um, or like financials, you know, like we, we all make like bad financial decisions yeah. if we try to wing it. Uh, so you have to be like, you know, remove as much of like emotion and try to, uh, you know, have, have like some kind of a strategy there. Yeah, and, okay. Um, that makes a lot of sense. So I think that's a very good uh, touch point where maybe we can ask you to describe what solace is at a high level as if you were speaking to someone at a dinner party who doesn't know very much about crypto. Yeah, so basically what Solus focuses on is uh, insuring depositors. So you, um, as a participant of financial system, you wanna deposit your funds into, you know, different like apps, projects, protocols, um, but basically like you deposit money into any entity with an expectation of either like a return or it's some kind of like a product. You know, even if you think about like trading or like swapping like one token for another, that is like already like one function is like does constitute a financial product. And so because your tokens or like your funds, your assets are now at an external party, right? Like they left your wallet there in a smart contract or like somewhere else like roaming around that entity whether it's like an automated smart contract or like some yielding strategy uh or just like a vault or something that entity can lose your funds like it because it's code uh people like the, the probability of you covering 100 percent of like all the edge cases and you know there's a lot of complications in these yeah, like apps because really, yeah. uh we always you know champion that the blockchain is safe uh, but the, the blockchain is just like a computer, it's a substrate, right? And then you have all these like apps running that sometimes can malfunction or hackers can get into. So like those kind of risks that we're covering, basically you put in money somewhere else um, and in case that entity doesn't perform as designed, as expected, yeah. yeah, we will we'll pay you back if you are a policy holder. So that is like fundamentally the product that we're offering to individuals, uh, whether it's like retail or, you know, a company, um, CFI asset managers can like benefit from it. So we wanted to mature the industry to the level where even if you like lose the money, um, you, you get it back. And so you see, if you look back at the history, that's really where all the financial systems in the world like matured to, because before the 20th century, you know, like financial system was usually very uh, localized and limited. And then also um, broader population didn't really like partake in it directly. Like obviously 
they do engage in in the economy by like you know working getting salary like buying goods and like selling stuff uh but then like banking wasn't you know, as proliferated as right now uh and then all these like companies you know like raising and like start selling stocks to the users like some of them were like, going bust and all that so the security in general um back then was like pretty poor and then in the, in the 19th century, um, like in the U.S., some states started like trying to introduce depositor insurance among like a few banks in that state, and uh, they didn't like really succeed just because it was like a very like small scale. It was hard to like enforce some of it. So when the bank would go bust, like people would lose the money. Yeah. Uh, and then in 1933, you see like the FDIC, kind of like the Federal Depositor Insurance Corporation. Uh, comes into play and so like the entire like US banking system sort of like unites um, in that sense that if you're a depositor to the bank uh, you don't have to worry about like the risks that the bank does or carry uh, basically like it abstracts those type of risks away from the user so now we can all just put our money in the bank and w even if the bank goes bust like we know the government will like, pay us up to a certain limit and so basically in 1934 that system kind of like went live and then you see every country adopt the same like level of uh security and so um pretty much like every like financial like product then you add some customer protection you add um all these like tools where now you can leverage them you can use them but you don't really have to dig in deep and like analyze all the risks yourself yeah uh, basically it you know, you're protected either by default or you have like easy to use tools out there to leverage. And so now with the advent of DeFi, um, we create the new financial system that is like in many ways, like much more like efficient and global. Um, and we still like haven't reached that level of maturity, right? Because if you are using a protocol, um, you're, you're completely like exposed and very few people in the world can actually like wrap their head around all the like these risks you know let alone like analyze them yeah and you know even us as a protocol like you know we we might be unaware of like some of the like attack vectors or like some of the risks that uh we're exposed to because you know everyone is experimenting absolutely um, yeah yeah and like we want to create a better system uh a bulletproof system but then we, we're still like not there yet right no, absolutely uh, not. and so it's only like the next logical step that hey if we want the wider population to use DeFi and not just you know tech technologists or like enthusiasts uh or like the big funds and stuff right you you need to mature um the kind of like the, the base the level security the yeah. industry as a whole um and so like that's why you know the first product like we we wanted to like offer it to different partaking parties and now also started focusing more on ensuring like actual like, protocols and a project so you know whoever is using them they can have the confidence that hey like if, if something goes wrong um they have some kind of like level of protection yeah and, um, and that the enables user. the the broader market participants to uh really take this industry to the next level similar to how you described the traditional finance system did with the advent of insurers that could enable trust really um and it's it's great to see that you're so so passionate and, and clearly very knowledgeable about this industry um with particular regards to solus if i am a new user what's it going to look like what's the the current state what are some of the services that you do provide and what might be the use case for me not only as a technologist or enthusiast but someone that's new to DeFi to using solus yeah so you know, getting insured is pretty straightforward with Solus, and um, our product actually is quite different from all other DeFi insurances, like most of them. And that was kind of like the first like products that like surfaced. You would buy a policy for a set exposure. So, like if you want to deploy capital into a protocol A, like whatever it is, uh, you would buy a policy for that protocol. We thought that it's kind of like also unnecessary like overhead for the users, and you have to like basically with every investment or like every capital deployment, you have to like buy a policy if you want to be like actually like stay protected. And then you have to 
pay uh, for like a set period of time. So like prepay basically the coverage like, into yeah. the future. And um, just like a lot of work in like management and I we thought that it could be like easier, like why wouldn't we just like ensure that address, right? Like, so that's the policy, like the product that we have right now. And it literally, you just connect the wallet. Uh, we almost like instantly see all of your like exposures and the investments you have uh, in that wallet. And yeah, like you buy the policy, you top up the balance on it. So virtually it, it works very like in simple fashion. It's like a prepaid debit card or like a prepaid SIM card where you just like toss the balance on top and then we dynamically see your portfolio uh, and as it changes as well. So you can just get the policy and forget about it and then you're staying protected across over like 220 protocols. Uh, one policy also could cover that address across up to like like four chains right now that we're on. So oh, wow. Ethereum, Polygon, Phantom, Aurora. Um, so you have one policy on one chain and you can roam freely around those four chains. And yeah, we offer coverage for like the most number of protocols out of like any other uh, DeFi insurance right now. So that is like very easy, low maintenance tool. Just got to make sure like that there's money on the balance and then you can just like soon as it like basically forget about it and focus on, you know, like producing yield, like making money, like yeah, using yeah. actually like the tools without the headache of maybe like researching and like trying to like manage your own risk. Absolutely. So we really want to like free up the bandwidth and, you know, at a personal level, it makes a lot of sense, but then we see a lot of like interest from, um, different like companies that deploy capital, different fund managers, because, you know, they have to actually basically run their own research teams that dig through the protocol just to make sure that the capital isn't going to get, you know, lost. But now they can completely outsource that to a policy yeah, yeah. Uh, that covers them. So it really takes, I think, I think we're counting it's like two or three clicks basically just to like get insurance and it's like the easiest and like the fastest way uh you don't need to like register or like do anything um so yeah we're, we're pretty happy about like the tool and the, the ui that are produced you can also like simulate your portfolio basically you can see like how your premium will change based on different risks like you can also like check what uh, how the protocols are like rated yeah, um, yeah and then yeah we're also like the only protocol that actually completely publishes like open source the entire risk modeling and the whole like pipeline mm -hmm. um just because we we believe that i mean first of all like more people will take a look at it like the better we pressure test the logic absolutely so i, I think that's the the greatest benefit of the open source uh code and stuff uh and we want to invite like more and more people uh for that kind of work um a funny thing actually like when uh, like a year ago, I was talking to like a lot of like VCs and as we were just getting started with this uh, development of like the current version of the risk modeling, risk assessment pipeline and all that, a lot of them thought that uh, it would be hard to attract uh, like risk assessors and like people from maybe like traditional insurance industry or just generally like individuals interested in that line of work. Um, but it just so happened that we got the most interest actually from that side, like when we we're trying to hire, because like obviously like we were like scaling the team throughout the year and uh, trying to get like the devs, you know, you have like business development people, like content guys, and, and yeah, the, the, the easiest one was actually to get the, the risk managers because oh, right. um, they couldn't utilize their skill anywhere in crypto, but it's always. Yeah. Because uh, okay. yeah, we just have like this like open source and like we were like, really um cultivating the, the, that idea you know like throwing and um talking a lot in like discord and so it's yeah it, it's fun i don't have any background in insurance but just through conversations with like people who you know have like years of experience and that from like different ends on like assessment or like underwriting and like all these sorts of things um so yeah i've been able to learn quite a lot no that's um that's actually really really good to hear i think we covered a little bit some some challenges that you experienced whilst you were trying to scale the business. So maybe we can talk a little bit about the short period after the inception of Solist. So really those three months when you were grinding, you know, working out the idea, testing your thesis, eventually scaling the team. What was that process like? What were some of the most memorable events that you can remember that served as 
a checkbox like this was an achievement for Solace. Yeah, I think hiring and generally like running the team, cultivating like the team spirit, the values, like what is the mission, uh, what is like the vision there um, is has been like the, the most like challenging thing because you know like once you know what you want to build it's like fairly straightforward but a lot of teams are you know like struggling with just like management overhead or like the team mechanics um just misalignment on maybe like the idea of like the implementation all that so the, i think at the end of the day like the success comes from like a, a good team because i think in the industry like it, it there's so much to build, right? Like there's so many like things you can build uh, and, uh, and so the many demand. different approaches. So keeping the team aligned yeah, and, yeah. and all pulling in the same direction was was something which required a lot of uh, leadership in a way. Yeah, and so like that's where like you know a lot of like my focus uh, goes because uh, you know obviously like hiring is also like it's probably like the hardest thing, um, yeah. like. For me personally, like finding the right people, because um, yeah, with like little time and like we meet everyone on the internet, like you don't have like the personal like feel yeah uh, for them um, from like talking in person. So that, that that was challenging, and I guess like getting the first people in. Like I remember it took it took me a month of like I literally like, I didn't write code. Like for a month, I was only hiring. Like that yeah. was like the sole uh, purpose, and then at the end of the month. I was, I mean, first of all, like exhausted from like all the conversations Absolutely. and trying to like understand whether like that's the right fit. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, I, I found a guy and then luckily like I had a friend and um, she, she, she ran like a consulting firm, like she had like a few devs. So basically in order to get started faster, she helped her, her name is Ksenia. Uh, she helped to develop the protocol in the first like few months until you know, we, we got like a little like up to speed and I also got bandwidth to like get more people on board and yeah, yeah. Uh, get going. So, you know, sort of like bootstrapping the team, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good way um, to, to scale, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so that, that that's how we did it. But um, but yeah, hiring is like always challenging. And then up until the summer, really, like we, we scaled up with like, we had the team of um, like four engineers. Like I was also like writing code at the time. And um, and because we're on the calls every day together, like we would have like a daily like check-in, uh, we sync up and then we go back and write code. Like that was everyday work. Um, people who work with you, they feel and can sort of get, uh, get the spirit and like the vision and like the values directly from you. Yeah. And so we didn't have to like really invest much time or effort into like, Oh, like what are our values? Right. Like we never like outlined that, but then as soon as you get maybe like up to like, like five or six people, or as soon as you start like splitting the teams, yeah, it becomes critical to provide the right context Yeah, absolutely. because you need to let everyone to make their own decisions on the spot. And if they don't have the context, if they, if they don't know like what is like the end game, like yeah, what is the, the end goal, the vision, the they, yeah, like you you quickly get misaligned. And so like over the summer, we put in like a lot of like work and effort into just like really writing down like what are like the values and like what makes our team like special, like what we what do we want to cultivate, like how do we want to frame the decision making, like all of these sorts of things, and then it's all about like reinforcing it and like making sure, you know, the philosophy of the team is always there because now, you know, I, I trust everyone on my team to make right decisions without asking me. Yeah. Like I, I trust that they um, have, you know, the right skill set, but also the right context within they can utilize, you know, their, like, their tools, decision yeah. making framework. Yeah. And yeah. so that allowed us to like scale. And I think like, that's the hardest problem um, that a lot of like teams like overlook because you think like, Oh, like, I mean, like who cares like about like values, right? Like, right? like we need to get the code done and we need to deploy this smart contracts. Like, but if, if you're just like always in this like grind mode and you don't, you know, put your head up and like look around, it's, it's very easy to like, get lost 
Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, I can I can totally see how that would make you scale at a completely different pace. And it's great to hear. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about Solace today, um, how you guys are shaping the original problem statement, if at all, uh, how it's going, making progress towards solving the original problem statement and what we have to look forward to in the near term. Yeah, so really, you know, we want to live in the world where everyone can utilize DeFi uh, and they don't have to like waste days or hours to like figure out all the like risks around, you know, if you want to use the product, just like, you know, use it and it should perform as intended. So in order to like allow that world, we really need to create efficient infrastructure for all the projects, all the protocols to get insurance, but then also for whoever basically wants to access that. Um, and I think now it's, it becomes like more and more apparent that protocols should provide base layer insurance. And so that's what we're focusing on uh, right now. Like in a few weeks, we'll launch this whole infrastructure. And I think that will be kind of open up the new era uh, because until today, you, we don't really have like a scalable way to insure protocols. And so I never um, kind of like intended to be maybe like an insurance shop and like going around the corner and like, you know, selling a policy to like a protocol. Um, it's we we really want to create like a scalable system and so scalability was always like one of the very big points that we build and design and so i th think right now we um kind of correct the architecture that can work and also uh facilitate insurance to a lot of different parties by a lot of different parties and so like you create this infrastructure um and then yeah so once we launch it's going to be all just aggressive like scaling and onboarding more and more protocols uh, because actually like the, the more risk you pull together, uh, the more diversified it is, the, the security the goes up. The better yeah. methodology is tested. Yeah, um, exactly. So it makes a lot of sense. Uh, you, It's clear that you guys place a lot of focus on the vision, culture, team alignment, um, but not only that, but also the UX for the services that you provide. And how you're really seeing it is evolving from just offering the services to users and scaling it to multiple protocols across DeFi in order to get to that revolution, which you mentioned earlier about enabling trust within DeFi to get these big funds, these larger institutions, perhaps even traditional companies to come onto DeFi and use it as a base layer for their financial needs. Um, what about in six months and one year maybe two years ahead. How do you see the needs changing from the customers and also DeFi? What are some new technologies that could help you really take this to another level? Yeah, so when we talk about Solus in the, you know, like midterm, like six, six months to like a year, I think we always kind of put uh, um, like 100 protocols being insured is uh, like a nice bar to uh, yeah. strive towards. Um, in, I mean, realistically, probably like six to 12 months, like we can we can get there with the system design that we have. Um, I mean, obviously there are probably gonna be like challenges and issues. So, um, but yeah, really the idea is to drive protocols to always have insurance. Like, you know, I really wanna see the industry where protocol like deploys, like operates and uh, the users of that protocol don't have to worry that, hey, like, you know, they might get hacked or like, like something like that because it opens up the bandwidth for it, like everyone and just gives like confidence in the system. We are developing DeFi, like now we really need to like focus on uh, and like mature that system. So that's kind of our really like primary strategy right now in scaling. Um, obviously, like on the user side, it's, it's not like we're like phasing out anything, like we're continuing developing. And uh, luckily like our team has uh, uh, successfully like scaled and everyone is working like very diligently, like efficiently. We have like multiple projects in parallel. Currently we have 16 full-time and five part-time people that like helping to drive all of that Amazing. growth. Um, so yeah, this is especially, you know, now with the market correction yeah. Uh, you see a lot of people kind of like pulled out their like personal funds and like some companies uh, have done this. So, and I think it's like perfect timing uh, for us to really 
like build up the fundamentals uh yeah. DeFi among the protocols uh get everyone like access to insurance yeah the next bull run can be completely different yeah so what's your what's your approach towards enabling these DAOs or protocols how are you how are you thinking about onboarding them and hitting that 100 protocol target yeah so really um there there, there are two parts to it so uh the, the protocols uh now are able to like efficiently like underwrite basically their own insurance um so the product their... is that the services are available yeah and so um basically a protocol can you know put in their token into like the, the underwriting pool like which is virtually an index uh, of a bunch of different tokens right um and because most of the protocols sit on the liquid like treasuries like everyone has like a lot of their token but it's not like you can like sell it or like even like pay like salaries maybe uh and you know diversifying and like measuring protocol treasuries is like a huge like major challenge yes, in general absolutely. and so like what we're offering uh in order to bootstrap the underwriting capital is basically like a swap like we allow a protocol to exchange like their token for an index basically a basket of like all the insured protocols uh and so we use that to underwrite the insurance basically everyone who puts in uh and like swaps the capital now they have um some power and control over the insurance capacity that the protocol provides and so they can direct it to themselves um and basically get insurance through that and doesn't require them to pay any dollars or um you know it's very like easy and like yeah light because enabling we know, like a novel use case for DeFi treasuries that has not existed before yeah that's powerful man so basically like unlocking those two because i mean underwriting and like getting bootstrapping that underwriting capital is tough and like we just saw one problem and i thought like, okay like we can solve those two problems at the same time yeah um so that's how it kind of like came to be like the whole like bootstrapping but then a protocol basically can get like insurance with it so um that way it, it can scale like very well uh and we form this like index if we need to make a payout and uh we actually never sell the tokens too like we just use that basket of assets as a collateral to like leverage take out stable coins and then we can pay back that loan uh with the premium payments like on the on the insurance policies so it actually is like a very capital efficient way um to to do insurance and like underwrite and basically make sure like we can cover like all of the participating parties within but when we talk about like what solus does and how an onboarding looks it's um uh, it's really you know we we set like the min and max caps on like how much of the individual tokens we can accept because basically we need to manage the volatility on the underwriting pool we need to manage the composition so we're like never overexposed or like biased one way or another yeah um so that's pure like capital risk management um and then on the policies side right we need to come up with a number which is like it's called rate online basically okay. like annualized premium so how much off of like x amount of funds like you need to pay um and that is uh that work is basically done through our like risk management pipeline that risk assessment um work that we've been doing and so we just aggregate a lot of data trying you know pretty much all the available data that we can get our hands on uh we aggregate we have a bunch of different attributes and then um we approach risk assessment from quantitative and like statistical approach uh probabilistic uh modeling and so that basically allows us to reach that number right so it could be like two percent one and a half like two and a half maybe five percent if the, the the protocol is like risky um so yeah like once they like lend on that number um now we can like open up a policy for that and they can put in their tokens into this like underwriter log basically um and get access to insurance that's that's quite powerful i think We've got a good idea about what Solus does today and obviously your journey into arriving to the present. What about the future? How are you seeing the product evolve or the need evolve in the long dated future? Like two, three, four years out, fundamental changes to the insurance 
ecosystem within DeFi and also broader? Yeah, I mean, I think let's say we're successful in our quest maybe like in a few years, right? And like we actually get a large number of protocols insured. Um, there are like a lot of risks with like activity and actually like you never have like 100% certainty about anything. It's all about like modeling and trying to like predict the future like as good as you can. Yeah. Um, and so from that standpoint, uh, we're like super excited to, you know, undertake the work on actually like managing the, the underwriting capital because that's the whole separate uh, field, right? Because now let's say we do have a basket of assets, right? Like we, sh we, we could make money with it. Right, like that's a that's a fund, and it it should be utilized. Like it shouldn't be just like sitting idle there. And so more active management uh, of the funds and the capital. And I think I mean you see that in general, like in DeFi, like that that's a, that's a challenging thing. Uh, how do you like utilize the assets that you have? Um, so obviously, like as the thing scales, like we'll partake more in whatever underwriting capital we have already right now. It's you know it just sits idle, like. Uh, we want to grow our bandwidth to manage that capital uh, more actively. But then on the other side, what I mentioned like about like ROL and like the whole risk assessment, um, there's so much cool and fun stuff like you can do um, with like modeling, like predicting uh, different risks, you know, like enriching the data because um, data harvesting is challenging right now. I uh, just getting the data stuff. Uh, and also like, you know, we live on just a few years of history. Uh, yeah. So the longer it becomes, like the more data we have, like the better the, the modeling can be. Yeah. Uh, but then also like what attributes do you analyze? Like, you know, you can always get like a little more granular, but then also discovering some hacks, like, you know, like a few things from intuition can tell you like, hey, like if they use maybe like this, like for example, if a protocol uses an Oracle, that introduces like an attack vector, right? Yeah. So just from pure intuition, you can say like, hey, like, you know, if they're using like oracles, maybe they're less secure than the protocols that don't use oracles. Yeah. Um, that not that's not necessarily true, but uh, like you you just want to like discover these like few little like hacks, and then like you plant into like the modeling and the data, and so um, I, I think sky's the limit of like how um, complicated or like convoluted those systems can be, but um, like analyzing, like running assessment can obviously allow for the whole system to like scale much more efficiently, actually produce more value. Uh, because if that modeling is good and you have like pretty good underwriting pool from, you know, like risk exposures perspective, and also you can uh, plan the capital like expenditures for a longer period of time, uh you can leverage deeper and so uh th that is kind of like the, the the end game right like can you insure i don't know like five billion dollars with one billion dollar um you know in traditional insurance like leverage factor of five um like is possible not in crypto right now and so the the, the smarter we get about risk assessment and like managing the underwriting capital uh the more value we can provide uh, yeah. to the protocols, to the end users. And so um, I, I, I'm i certain DeFi will grow um, even like, you know, much, much greater than what it is right now, because I think the value of it is apparent and we, we, we need to have insurance there. And so that's kind of like the work we're like focusing on because we, we want to, um, to provide basically all these DeFi services to a much wider population, because I think there's a lot of like benefits in this new system. Yeah, for sure, bringing DeFi global. Wow, what a tremendously exciting future to look forward to. Thank you very much, Nikita. It was a pleasure to have you here. You know, we've, we've dove really deep into understanding what insurance can enable for the DeFi space. It's been, it's been tremendously insightful, and we just really want to thank you for coming on. Let you have the last word if you want to shout out the socials of Solace, where people can find out a bit more about the protocol and use it. Um, the floor is yours. Yeah, I mean, obviously, thanks for having me. I very much enjoy the conversation. Uh, we, we touched on like pretty cool topics uh, that, you know, I don't get to talk often. Uh, usually you're like very nitty gritty, but it's, it's nice to like talk about big picture and stuff. Um, so yeah, pleasure to be here in 
Um, I invite like everyone obviously to join our Discord. Like we have a lot of like smart individuals there, and I think um, that's what like makes makes always great is like a lot of ideas like roaming around. So we are always like very active and engaging there. Uh, but you know, Twitter is a, is a, another great way to connect uh, and like stay up updated with everyone. And of course, you can always like message me. I'm always online, <laughs> just like most people in this industry. So, um, so yes, like stay up to date. Um, I think our, our Twitter account is Solus Pi. Um, there will be a link for that. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the website, solus.pi, uh, you can get insurance there. Obviously, we have like staking and like other um, stuff in the token. So, um, looking forward to seeing you on our website. Definitely. Yeah. And we will put all of the relevant links just below in the description. You can also find links to our other Define episodes where we dig into other topics. And that's it for today, guys. Thanks so much.